Welcome, and I see also some new faces, so nice meeting you. Thank you for being here. I'm going to add a little bit on the logistics from Sergio, just five minutes of information, and then we'll go right into our speakers. Uh, how we are going to go today, we have two hours and a half. We are going to have three sections to this event. The first section, we have nine incredible speakers. And we are going to have 10 minutes back to back. Each of them, they are going to be sharing their perspective on the code of ethics. After that, we are going to have a short period, 20 minutes or so for Q&A. Hold your questions until we get there because otherwise they are going to be get lost in the chat. So wait, write them down and wait until we go into the Q&A. After the Q&A, we are going to open breakout rooms. In these rooms, we are going to have one private room for each of the nine speakers and their organizations. That way you can connect one of one with them. We also have three social lounges in case you would just want to network. You saw a friend that you haven't seen in a while and you want to have private conversations or network with somebody else, you are able to go there. So that's basically what we are doing for the next two hours and a half. I invite you, as Sergio was saying, to have the camera on if, if possible. I understand sometimes you have kids around or you don't feel well or you're driving and we don't want you to distract you with that. However, if you can be fully present, that will be a big difference for you in terms of how you take on the information that is going to be shared by the speakers. As I introduce the speakers, I will read their bio because this is important also for the recording. The bio takes 30 seconds. I just want you to know that these nine speakers, each of them bring 20 to 40 years of experience in the field. These are the researchers, the advocates, the, the ones who are involved in 100 different committees to make the profession better. So please take advantage of having this wealth of wisdom in here with these nine, nine speakers with us today. And in terms of language, we want to make sure that we use respectful language. This is a professional environment. And I mean that for the chat, for the Q&A, and when you are in breakout rooms with the speakers and with your colleagues. So make sure that you use that respectful language. I will also be posting on the chat some of the links to the organizations that are presenting. So you have that handy or the program that you may already have seen, you want to have that handy. Now, what is the topic for today? Code of ethics how important this is and how sometimes we forget about it because we get busy with life and translations, interpreting things that we need to do. And we don't pay enough attention to what really matters. And this is not a new topic. This is something that has been studied for thousands of years. If we go back to the Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, among many others, when they focus on what is the purpose of life, how do we achieve happiness? And you may think right now, why are you talking about happiness? We are going to be talking about code of ethics. And the one reason is many of these philosophers and researchers, they found a direct connection between code of ethics and integrity and morals with what your happiness is. And that's what we are all looking at the end, right? So you know, look at what these incredible speakers are going to be presenting today and how we can apply this into our professional lives and into our personal lives. There are going to be many golden nuggets that you are going to be receiving. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce our very first speaker. And uh, let me go here. She is Dr. Christy Andriessen from the International Association of Conference Interpreters, AIC. Many of you know AIC, of course, and AIC is, a, Dr. Christian is a legal and conference interpreter, mainly for international courts, professor, scientific director of several training programs for legal interpreters and international communication for lawyers. From 1999 to 2012, prof, she was professor at the University of Applied Sciences in Madrenburg, Stendhal. Until 2022, she was scientific director for the legal interpreting program at the University of Hamburg's training center, scientific co-director of the new training program of the Institute for Intercultural Communication, ISIT, and a certificate for legal interpreters and translators. She participated in various EU projects. In 2014, she, she won the Danika Seleskovic Prize. So welcome, Dr. Christian. 
Hello. <laughs> uh, may I uh, start immediately because the time is very short. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all that uh, I was invited and had the opportunity to give you some thoughts. In fact, I'm very, very grateful to the organizers who were so kind to send us uh, some of the questions and the questions were so relevant that I decided simply to follow the thread. And if I may, I would like to share my screen so that uh, to save time, I have prepared a presentation. So this is the subject we have today. And the first question who was submitted to us was why is the code of ethics so important? And in fact, the code of ethics is essential because it means the self-control for socially powerful profession. And uh, as Lola mentioned, she mentioned uh, immediately the uh, Hippocrates. And in fact, it was the first attempt in the Western uh, culture, because I don't know how it is in the Eastern part of this world, but it was the first attempt to describe, uh, to, to show how a profession should be self-controlled. We don't want the states to interfere. We don't want the administration to interfere, but a profession has, who has such a power should be in a position to control itself so that there are, uh, that we avoid, avoid uh, abuse of power. And all these professions nowadays, these powerful professions like lawyer, journalists, medical doctors, and so on. I have my computer full of this code of ethics, uh, which I uh, used for my comparison with other professions. And all these professions have the same universal principles. And the main, the gist of it is to avoid uh, abuse of power. Here you have the oath of Hippocrates, and there you could, you can find everything. Uh, which we still use now in our uh, professional ethics. Uh, interpreters and also translators are a socially powerful profession. I don't need to, <clears throat> to uh, mention more because I know you are all aware of it. And what is very important is that our, uh, our code of professional ethics uh, have the same universal principles as those of other influential professions. You can find the same main universal principle everywhere. There is to be made uh, a distinction to be made between the code of professional ethics, and this is something I uh, would like to to criticize a little bit because uh, many of us get mixed up with professional practices, with best practices, or within AIC, we call it professional standards, which are specific aspects referring to these universal principles. But uh, you have to, to, to make the distinction because obviously the, the practice of an interpreter is different from the practice of a lawyer or of a journalist. But for the universal principles, we share them with this profession. And what is the purpose? In fact, the purpose to my mind is to provide orientation to avoid this abuse of power and also to have a tool for decision making. So you, you cannot say you have a recipe with do's and, and don't like uh, you have in uh, in law, but you have to to find your own so solution yourself. So how does it fit together? Uh, how can we separate all these aspects? You have first of all the sources of professional ethics. Uh, if you are environmentalist, 
then you refer to nature. If you believe in a God, you have divinity, you may also refer only to morality or to the three of it. Or if you are more uh, for reason and logic, you have these value. So, and all these value build our professional ethics. And then after that, we uh, have a profession and then we have these professional ethics and all these personal and professional ethics, ethics can in fact have to cope with the law. Sometimes we might have some conflict. So the next question was, which are the top principles we need to abide by? And I found uh, I could refer to these universal principles. If we are not competent, we don't accept an assignment. And then this principle you find everywhere, confidentiality. And also this aspect never take advantage of information obtained in the course of an assignment. And this you can find everywhere with these strong and uh, professions, socially strong profession. So, and then I will be very short with these uh, challenges uh, <clears throat> in the workplace for translator and interpreters, because to my mind, the challenges are so unpredictable uh, that you have to find yourself a solution which cannot be offered by uh, a ready-made solution by a code. What you have to do is to develop a method uh, for taking a decision. And it's there that a code of ethics is, a, is simply there to guide us in the evaluation of our actions. And how does it happen? Uh, you take your code of ethics and you see, well, if uh, you are, for instance, you work for an NGO, then you may be altruistic, but you cannot make a living. Then you have an action where you harm, you, you harm others and you harm yourself. In, for instance, if you are not competent, not prepared for a, an assignment, and you accept it, then you know uh, how you are a harm to, us, to others and to yourself. Uh, to be uh, egoistic, you do undercutting of the price or you slander your colleagues, and this would be egocentrical. But the aspect you should find in your code of ethics is something to search for the benefit of others and for of oneself. This is not my invention. This is a, an inspiration by the uh, uh, utilitarist, uh, the, uh, Jeremy Bentham and Stuart Mills. And I think this might be what you have to look for in your code of ethics. The next question are the legal consequences of violating a code of ethics. Then there, I think that uh, there are no legal consequences for violating a code of professional ethics, because the code of professional ethics uh, require disputes to be settled internally. So you don't go first to, to, to court if you have a conflict with the colleagues. Uh, the code of ethics, most of the code of ethics say, well, you have to try to find a set, an internal settlement. So, and then if there is a problem, of course, you, uh, the national courts have jurisdiction over the uh, violation of certain articles. Maybe it can be criminal offense or a violation of certain provisions leading to damages. So it looks like this. But of course, your, the association, the organization uh, is uh, always entitled to sanction a member who has been uh, sanctioned by law, by the court. So this is which might happen. But 
uh, you cannot say that there is a direct if you if you commit a violation of the code of professional ethics that there are legal consequences there, there are no legal consequences so you might uh, nevertheless have potential conflicts if you have some personal values and professional ethics and the law you 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 can have situation for instance if you see that uh, you work you interpret uh, at a body station and you see that the person you have to interpret for uh, has lots of uh, uh, <clears throat> black spots on the on the body then you may assume that he has been beaten up and then the question is to know well i am an interpreter my professional ethics requires that i'm neutral that i only interpret but uh, how is it uh, does it coincide with my personal ethics and how is it with the law so in short i could bring more uh, examples but uh, i just wanted to give a hint because you don't we don't have the time so and how can a code of ethics be used to create better and more professional relationships and this is very very important and i'm glad you asked these questions so a code of ethics in fact uh, defined good practice towards other clients professional colleagues and associations so you you know that uh, you you have these guidelines and it should not be uh, punitive you have to adhere uh, to this decision making tool and not feel oh my god if i don't stick to this code maybe i will be punished and thrown out of the association this is not what a powerful profession uh, should accept we should be proud of uh, our uh, code of ethics and the code of ethics should foster corporate identity or professional identity that's why it is very positive and if you consider other professions such as doctors lawyers journalists you will see that they all the time refer with pride to their code of ethics of professional ethics and that they don't complain that they have to stick to it so and this is what i saw this morning in hamburg thank you I've been, I've tried to be very fast and it was not easy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christian. This is, is wonderful and how you refer to the identity piece because that, that's certainly a, a, a huge, huge piece for our code of ethics. And for me, I know this is a late time for you. Thank you so much for being here. Our next speaker is Regina Landek from the Association of Translators and Interpreters of Alberta. Regina is a certified translator from German to English and English to German. She holds a law degree from Germany, a postgraduate diploma in adult education and a master's degree in translation. She taught legal translation at New York University for many years and still teaches webinars for translation candidates. She currently serves as a member at large of ATIA's board of directors and as co-chair of the CITEC board of examiners. Welcome Regina. Hi, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, a lot of um, very important points have already been made by Christian. So um, just as she did, I, I'm just going to respond to the individual questions as we go. Um, why is a code of ethics so important in your view is the first question. And um, of course, you know, I agree with everything uh, that was said before. But I would like to, to add a, um, a little um, uh, definition here. So a code, codes of ethics are professionally accepted standards of professional and business behavior, values and guiding principles. And they encompass you know, the personal and corporate standards of behaviors that we expect from professionals. Codes of ethics are usually established by professional organizations to help guide members in performing their job functions uh, in accordance with sound and consistent ethical principles. They're important because we need to set a baseline for acceptable behavior. Now, what is the purpose of a code of ethics? Well, you know, it sort of 
goes hand in hand with what I just said. Um, codes of ethics set behavior standards that are accepted by individual professions. And of course, they have to vary depending on the profession because there may be um, certain aspects that one uh, profession has uh, that another one doesn't. Um, in any case, they are meant to guide the members of that profession and also provide sanction options for non-compliance. And in this regard, they share some characteristics with laws and regulations. Um, because if you set a standard for behavior, you also need to have a tool to deal with non-compliance. Otherwise, uh, a code of ethics has no teeth. This may just be the lawyer in me speaking. Uh, so what are the top principles we need to abide by? Well, I the first three that came to my mind are honesty, integrity, and transparency. And all these ideas are, of course, interrelated. So we need to be honest about our qualifications and our skills vis-a-vis -vis our clients and also, of course, vis-a-vis -vis our colleagues. Integrity we must conduct our business uh, following moral and ethical frameworks. You know, and this includes honesty and consistency and the willingness to hold ourselves accountable for our actions, even if nobody is watching. Transparency refers to being open and honest. Again, you know, we're talking in circles here. As part of corporate governance best practices, this requires disclosure of all relevant information so others can make informed decisions. So if my area of specialization is the law, uh, I may need to say no to being asked to translate the operating manual for a heart transplant robot, right? Um, although it might may uh, might mean um, big, big bucks for me. Right? So what are some ethical challenges in the workplace for translators and interpreters? And how does the code of ethics address them? Well, there are many ethical challenges that I can think of. And, you know, I could talk for hours on those. Um, I would like to mention only one because I'm sure that my co-panelists um, have lots of ideas to contribute here as well. I think many ethical challenges come from um, pressure to perform and monetary considerations. Uh, unless you're independently wealthy, and I haven't met many translators and interpreters who are, um, you may find yourself in a position to take on a project that you're not really all that qualified for. And then you may justify it saying, you know, I really need the money and, um, you know, the others aren't better qualified either. Uh, we should strive to create a culture of honesty amongst our colleagues. However, and this is the problem, competition is global. And this is also uh, uh, represented by the, um, by the participants from all over the world today. Um, so, as long as there are agencies in um, different countries that offer services for very little money and don't necessarily abide by um, ethical principles, it's a difficult problem to solve. And I don't think I'll solve this today, but I welcome some ideas. Maybe later on in, in the uh, breakout room, we can talk a little bit more about it. Some examples of ethical practices. Well, this is a wide open field to plow. And again, I'm sure my co-panelists have great ideas to contribute. For me, personally, the most important ethical principle is honesty. Honesty creates trust and trust creates repeat business. And this way, ethical practice is also connected to business success. The next two questions I would like to combine, they are strategies to implement to make sure code of ethics are lived by professionals and identify legal consequences of violating the code of ethics, example of violations and how to prevent them. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about the procedure the Association of Translators and Interpreters of Alberta has had in place for many years. We do have a fairly decent code of ethics 
um, of course, like every set of rules, uh, things can change and we may need to adjust it. But it's, it's a fairly good document. Anybody who wants to join ATIA, either by direct admission through uh, exams or by transfer from another Canadian association, must write the code of ethics exam that we have in place. It's an online, it's, uh, an online exam. It consists of a case study. Uh, it's basically a story of a translator and or interpreter who does all kinds of horrible things. And the candidates then have to identify what horrible things they were and how they relate to the code of ethics. Uh, there are also 10 multiple choice questions as well. So this forces the candidates to familiarize themselves with the code of ethics. Okay? Before we put this exam in place, we just asked anybody joining the association to just sign a contract saying that they will abide by the code of ethics. But I bet you 95% of the people never actually read the document. Um, now, this is an open book exam, and uh, well, we don't expect people to know everything by heart. Um, the success rate is around 80%. So then in order to join ATIA after passing this and other prerequisite um, requirements, they're then um, asked to sign a contract stating that they will abide by the Code of Ethics. Um, as far as uh, how to deal with violations, of course, this is not a law, so we're not going to the court of law here, but ATIA has in place a discipline committee that deals with any, um, any complaints uh, that are brought forward uh, with regards to perceived unethical behavior. How can a code of ethics be used to create better and more professional relationships? Well, many codes of ethics also include clauses about cooperation and support of newcomers to the profession. There can also be clauses about outreach to post-secondary institutions and stakeholder bodies. And this will strengthen the profession in the long run, uh, and not just in Canada, but all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Regina, for wonderful ideas. And trust cannot it is the base for any relationships that we want to build, right? So our next speaker is Eric Poirier. He is the president of the Canadian Association of Schools of Translation. And using his experience in English and French translation, he teaches translation methodology and a specialized translation online at mm -hmm. UQTR. He designs learning and skill development activities in general and a specialized translation, more specifically for text in economics, finance, and business. Uh, Eric developed methods to make students learn key concepts and knowledge in basic areas and fields of application with a special emphasis on the empirical condition of their accurate and fluent translation. He also investigates bilingual translated parallel corpora for extraction of translation data and features that will contribute to corpus translation studies and to the advancement of knowledge in a specialized translation. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Lola. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank All you. All right. Thank you very much. So I would like to begin by thanking the organizing committee for inviting me to participate in this panel. First of all, I would like to share the definition of ethics from the Oxford Dictionary Online, which is similar to the one that Regina just uh, mentioned earlier. So it says, moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. That is to say that in order to have a code of ethics, you need to have some choices in the conduct of per professional activities, such as translation or interpretation. I think that the condition of having some choices is the key concept here for all of us in this panel. I must say that I'm not fully aware of all the studies in ethics that, I have, that have been published or that are going on in translation studies. This is not my main area of research, but it does impact on my main research area, just like it does impact the Canadian Association of Schools of Transla in Translation I represent. And I will explain how and why. 
I would like to cite one of the conclusions of Julie McDonough Dalmaya from York University at that time in 2011. Her paper, her paper is titled Moral Ambiguity, Some Shortcomings of Professional Codes of Ethics for Translators. She says about ethical codes, none stipulate how translators can make ethical choices with respect to the technology they might need in their practice. Yet, translators are increasingly using and being asked to use CAT software. First, let's, not, let's note that this was written in 2011, well before the advent of neural machine translation. Today, I have the impression that the issue is more like, would it be possible to translate without MT? Leaving aside the CAT tools issue, which was to some extent a prerequisite in the evolution of MT. This ethical problem is very relevant today in the market where machine translation and artificial intelligence, although being very promising and offering very interesting developments, is also perceived as a disruptive technology. There are a lot of questions that emerge from the role of using machine translation for the training of students in translation. I would like to have all the answer answers, but I don't. What I do think is that machine translation is an interesting tool and it must stay one of the tools used in the training programs in our universities. Unfortunately, it is very difficult to put restrictions on the use of this technology by translation student, students, especially in the context of increasing pressures and interests towards online training in translation. I think that teachers need to make uh, make use of machine translation in the machine translation in the design of learning activities in translation. I have personal ideas that are not that I don't have the time to share here, but let's say that there are a lot of discussions among university teachers on how to achieve that. I am very curious to hear what my colleagues have to say about this particular issue of teaching, translation, and interpretation. I am looking for innovative and robust solutions to this issue, and I am well aware that the university teachers all own the, the universe, pardon me, that the university teachers alone need the feedback of the professionals that are practicing translation and interpretation these days. I think that the top principles, to refer to the list of topics that was mentioned earlier, I think that the top principles that translation teachers must abide by are the same that their professional translators and colleagues must abide by. The requirement that professional translation is a human-based and communication service. Therefore, it has to be governed and monitored by human professionals. Another principle I believe is that the main activity of translators and interpreters is communicative in essence as opposed to the encoding decoding activity on which machine translation is very good at. One important activity also that is deeply human is just simple. It is understanding what the text or the client wants to communicate. Although surprising, this last principle seemed to me to be at the very core of what distinguishes machine, translate, machine operations and human translation or interpretation. In order to understand fully a message, you need to be similar enough, like sharing the same language, for instance, and this is cardinal. But one must never forget that in relation to the entropy entropy principle that is well established in machine translation, participants need to be different in order to have something of interest to say to each other. Therefore, translators and interpreters are specialists of this cultural and linguistic knowledge and experience that make us similar but also different. No machine will ever be able to achieve that. What is particularly difficult in a learning context is how do you measure that 
And how do you measure progress made by students while learning these principles? I think university teachers are all concerned that the recent technology progress did not make us more knowledgeable in that area. But there is hope. I think that university teachers are now, are now changing their perspective and their pedagogical tools to, make, to take that into account. But this is a challenging task. I think one, the, one of the area where we will see progress will be the translation quality assessment that needs to be more operational and objective, but not at the expense of professional know-how. That is why also I think it's very important that new teachers in translation need to be fully proficient in the practice of translation. But this is perhaps another ethical problem that can be addressed in other circles. Well, since I have in front of me a lot of professionals, I encourage you to participate in, to participate in empirical studies on translation and interpretation. I know this is not obvious. One can say paradoxically that the journey towards a better knowledge of understanding and human communication is about to start with or because of the advent of machine translation. I'm very happy to be here today at this event to share an exchange on ethics as regards more specifically machine translation for me and the caste organization I represent. I am very interested to continue the conversation on the inevitable collaboration between machine translation and human learning of professional translation and interpretation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. It's wonderful to have the university sitting around the table. We have to have that conversation of including academia all the time in our conversations and how machine translation is at the core of this conversation. I already start seeing some comments or questions on the chat about it that we are going to keep for the Q&A period. So thank you, Eric. Our next speaker is Claudine Dahom. Welcome, Claudine. Claudine is the president of the Canadian Translation Terminologists and Interpreters Council. A native of Montreal, Claudine is a certified English to French technical translator and a conference interpreter with over 18 years of experience. She holds a specialized Bachelor of English to French Translation and a Master of Translation Studies, both from Concordia University. She has served on the board of the Association of Translators and Interpreters of Nova Scotia as Vice President of Professional Affairs and as President and is currently the President of the Canadian Translators, Terminologists and Interpreters Council, CITEC. She lives to share the love of God with everyone and considers the golden rule as the foundation of all ethical principles. It is with these principles that she homeschooled her three grown children, Javier, Samara, and Faith. She currently lives in Halifax with her husband, Gary, and their children. Welcome so much, Claudine. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering how I share the screen. If do I, do I do the presentation before or do I? Um... You can just share the screen now if you want, Claudine. Yeah, okay, perfect. You're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so it's just three slides because I realized that the presentations that happened before were perfect. I don't know if you see the full screen or do you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, yes. okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to thank everybody for, well, Lola for inviting me and everybody else. It's a beautiful panel. And I'm really, really impressed by the first presentations thus far. Um, it, it was actually so complete that I had to right now modify my presentation so I wouldn't repeat and make it a little bit boring for you. But so I'm going to delve into a little bit more detail because what Christine said um, was exactly what needed to be said, I felt. And of course, Regina agreed with every point. And of course, Eric. So hello to everyone, by the way. Um, but uh, so I'm going to just talk about a few of the issues that are mentioned and a few of the issues that me as a personal practitioner and as president of CTEC, but not necessarily representing the opinion of CTEC, but um, what I have come to understand in terms of codes of ethics. And uh, let me begin. So the purpose of the code of ethics, it was very beautifully explained by the first uh, presenter, uh, but I will just add that the written word has power to affect change. So the fact that the code of ethics is actually written out 
it does have an impact, whether you read it, whether you pass an exam on it, or um, whether you consult it when you do have some ethical issues, it does govern, it first of all cl clarifies the principles that need to govern decisions. So that clarification is important because there's so many things to think about in any decision that it is important to, um, you know, basically write out uh, what should be the most important foundation for the, the difficult situ uh, situations we can find ourselves in. And so, of course, then it regulates the relationship between the professional and the client. But I would add, of course, and the reader or the listener, uh, the author. So there's there's a complex web of relationships between the translator and all the different parties. And that code of ethics can actually uh, not only you know, through the clarification and it can, can actually um, make the relationship better. Uh, so everybody is clear on exactly what the role is. And finally, it protects the population. So that is definitely something that is most important in, in uh, any profession. That when we think about lawyers acting ethically, we can right away see why that would be important to judges. If we see, you know, medical doctors, we see the importance right away. And for translators and interpreters, I know the translators and interpreters see those issues in their own work. Maybe people, maybe the population is not aware of how much can um, happen when there's one of those three elements that Christian, I'm sorry, I said Christine before, but like Christian mentioned in the beginning, whether you're not qualified to do a certain job in terms of translation or interpretation, uh, whether you don't respect the confidentiality uh, clauses that are usually accompany, uh, you know, important work. And also finally, if you are mistranslating or you're using the information for your own benefit. So those, you know, the population is, does not, is not aware of all these things that can happen and can really damage uh, individuals. So, you know, I will mainly talk about I'll just mention some of the issues that could maybe interest you and some of the um, you know, listeners might be researchers in the making or researchers already. And some of the, some, so these are some of the issues that um, you know, researchers are delving into, but there's so many more. Um, the first one is what should be the relationship between the translator, the author, the client, and the public, as I just uh, mentioned. Uh, so should it be, and I'll just give you an example, should the translator be, uh, you know, owe, owing uh, everything to the author and to render exactly what the author wanted to say? Of course, most people will say yes. That's we want the exact same message that the author had. Um, I tend to think as well that the uh, translator owes to the user of the information that he's going to present, and so he not only uh, has a, a certain uh, you know, tie to the author, but definitely also has to the reader or the user, without which the communication um, uh, process has no final meaning because the whole purpose is to reach that user. And I feel that that is something that in research has not been spoken about enough. And so, of course, there's always the relationship to the client because he's the one paying, you know, so the translators and interpreters are quite aware of that relationship, um, you know, just because of the financial um, risk. And of course, we want good reputation, as Regina had mentioned. Now, another issue that comes up is who owns the translation? Now, if I'm an author, um, you know, Usually, I have a copyright. If I'm smart with my signing of contracts with publishers, I should have royalties, and there should be definitely my name on the book, uh, unless I'm, you know, there's there's different arrangements possible. But usually, the writer gets recognition and definitely owns it. The publisher, I believe, owns the writing, and then, you know, but there's royalties to the author. Um, with translation, it doesn't seem like it's the case most of the time. Um, but this is a question that should be posed, especially we could say for literature translation. And uh, there's translation memories that I believe Eric spoke about uh, when he spoke about cat tools. 
when we're talking about translation memories, that means that we don't want to repeat those who don't know. <laughs> the, we don't want to repeat translating the same pieces of uh, paragraphs and sentences over and over. So there's this wonderful tool called computer assisted trans you know translation uh, software which allows you to save you know by text of what you've done before and then if it pops up again in your text it translates automatically or almost automatically so now who should own that now you know some companies have humongous translation memories and they share them with their freelance translators for example so that the work can go faster and of course they they can pay them less you know that's that's the idea between the translation memory but for 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 the client but the trans freelance translator is actually doing the work so should he have a say on i want to keep the translation memory at least the ones that i've kept uh, can you use them without my say but that's not right now the way it stands is that freelance translators don't have that right i believe in most uh, contracts uh but that is just because freelance translators haven't thought of insisting, I believe. So, so those are the types of things that are, you know, coming up, and they are not as broad as uh, Christian spoke about, but they should still be part of the discussion on what ethics should surround the work of translation interpretation. Another question that comes up is, should the translator get recognition? I spoke about that before, and there's another one that's a little bit. Um, you know, I have an opinion on it as well. Should his personality shine through or should he be perfectly neutral? Most people will say neutral, <laughs> right? But scientists know that even the best scientists, the most objective, you know, scientists cannot be perfectly neutral. That's just the truth, you know? So we have to know how should the personality shine through um, or how should we ensure the maximum amount of neutrality. Those are the types of issues we can talk about. And of course, uh, is perfect neutrality possible? I don't think it is, but you can always uh, research it and try to defend the other position. And uh, you know, another issue that comes up a lot is, of course, should medical interpreters offer help to the communicating piece? There's other you know, uh, types of interpretation, interpretation situations. Uh, I know that in Europe, it is more of a, the medical interpreter has more of a helper's role than in North America, where we're very, uh, you know, by the book, we want to be perfectly objective and the medical interpreter is not allowed to add any information that is not said already. So this is very interesting how the various uh, countries have different uh, interpretations of the same principles. And I just want to talk about one since I don't have that much time, but the beautiful introductions have allowed me to go into something that I that is very near and dear to my heart is the, this uh, idea that, um, you know, since we, we know, and again, Christian mentioned that the sources of uh, code of ethics is very important to understand where does it come from? Uh, we have nature, she spoke about reason, uh, God, uh, and uh, morality, right? So I, for me, it's all four, right? I think that they're all, they all uh, back each other up. And this is, you know, and uh, so, so, so in my view, and I, I mentioned that is that the golden rule is really at the foundation of any of my thoughts about ethics. When I'm in a tough situation, I often think to myself, what's the best thing to do for the people that are involved and or for the broader population, but it's not always easy to determine. Um, but one thing that always pops up, and this is what I would like to just mention, I don't know how many minutes I have left, I should have checked. Um, Lola, maybe you can tell me two minutes, one minute. Yes, you have one minute. One minute. One minute okay. So I'll just mention this, is that when I was listening to e Eric, e Regina, even Christian, and I was, you know, reading the different codes of ethics of the our provincial associations, I always, and I, and I think Regina has heard me say that before, but I am seeing that the, the three pillars of ethical behavior for any profession is, are you qualified to do the work? Is the number one, number two, confidentiality, number three, be honest, right? So, but the first one can be a problem 
because we do not expect, we do not require for translators and interpreters to be necessarily educated. So because of this, this is an issue that I, I consider that it is in a sense, a little bit of an unethical situation that we are in, maybe for example, in Canada, where we have a lot of immigrants come in and they require very good communication with the government and the various agencies that they deal with, but we don't necessarily have the interpreters and translators that are trained to be able to, to ensure the protection of this wonderful, these wonderful new, newcomers. So we also, um, again, and it was mentioned many times with the previous speakers, and this will be my final point, is that if we want to ensure and not only the recognition of the profession and the strengthening of the profession, but we want to ensure um, true ethical um, honesty of the translator, then we as bodies such as CTEC, which certifies translators, uh, but any others like the universities and the, the, the clients, authors, even the public, we should require that the translators get the best education possible. And so this is, I think that yes, translators can be very good. Their talents can be very good. They may not need it to equal someone that did get a bachelor's maybe, but the education, requiring education would raise the bar for everyone and would allow everyone to be actually, this would is what really would raise the bar of the, trans, of the profession. Okay, so thank you so much. And I will pass it to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Claudine. Wonderful, wonderful points. One of the common ethical dilemmas that we have received questions about is what happened now when the geographic you know, boundaries have diffused? And I'm working remotely for a company in Europe, in the US, in Canada, and the code of ethics are different, right? So this is something to really pay attention because even between Canada and the US, for example, for community interpreting, there are difference in, you know, where do we sit in terms of are you the linguistic conduit or are you, you know, more an advocate, right? So very important to understand those distinctions and where we sit. So thank you, Claudine. Our next speaker is Diego Crescieri, and he is the president of the European Language Industry Association. Diego is the CEO and founder of Creative Words. His clients include multilingual translation agencies, Italian companies aiming to internationalize, foreign companies aiming to enter the Italian market. He graduated in translation and interpreting at the University of Genoa. He is currently the president of the board of director of ELIA, the European Language Industry Association. At Creative Words, he is responsible for the company's strategy and growth. With a strong inclination to share when not involved in his company, he holds workshops and seminars on innovation, artificial intelligence and machine translation at universities, training in schools and language associations nationally and internationally. He enjoys spending his free time with his family and skydiving. Welcome, Diego. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you for organizing this. Can you hear me fine? Yes, yes. Yeah? Okay, good, thank you very much. So it's very difficult to come as sixth speaker, I guess. Everything has been said already. Uh, so I would bring my point of view, particularly as a company owner. And I like what Claudine did with questions. So today I will ask you questions rather than give you answers. Okay, so I will bring my point of view as the owner of an LSP, a language service provider. I, myself, uh, am faced with uh, ethical questions every day, honestly, with vendors, with clients, with projects. So. There are many questions that I need to ask myself every day, and this is what I'm, I will ask you today. And hopefully, I mean, everything has been said already. So that's, that's my contribution to this panel today. Um, for instance, talking about uh, customers, uh, what do you as a buyer, and I'm sure we have buyers as well in the, in the audience today, uh, what do you do if you know that your top vendor or your single vendor, maybe, uh, they pay peanuts to your sub providers. It's something that I'm facing every day. Uh, as an LSP, uh, do we find it ethical uh, to pay a lower rate that we can afford? 
And at the same time, what is we, what we can afford? Is it ethical to assume that your LSP clients is making money out of your own pockets? Because this is what I'm facing every day as well. There is this ongoing conflict between uh, freelancers and LSPs. We are often uh, said to be making money out of the freelancer's work. Um, someone mentioned MT as well. There's a lot going on with ChatGPT and generative AI. Let's see what happens next. I, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure what to think. Uh, but, but sometimes our customers, they ask us to just to translate a Word document. Should I find it unethical if I used MT or even Catools as a production tool, as a productivity tool? Should I use it? Should I don't? Uh, what what could they do? Is it unethical to use it? Maybe I, I don't know. And this brings me to the next question: Is it ethical for the customers uh, to be pretending or demanding to to check on our own projects, or should they maybe just care about the quality uh, we deliver? I, again, I'm not sure about this. Uh, should they check on our own projects? Should they trust us? I have a certified LSP. We have we own three certifications: the ISO 9001, the translation one, and the machine translation for the one. Should they check on who we use? Sometimes they do want to to know the names of the uh, very providers we use. Should they do that? Is it ethical? And uh, another one would be. I find I, I saw recently. Well, again, there's there's this fight going on between freelancers and uh, translation companies. It, it's an ongoing one. It's it's always been there since I remember. And um, is it ethical to talk bad about your customers? Maybe uh, to mention them online, to to tag them in an online post, and to. Well, basically to say that they, to blame them that because maybe they, they skip a payment or they are late a couple of days with payment is it ethical uh, i'm not sure again and next one uh, from the opposite uh, point of view is it ethical to pay them late uh, to pay your freelancers late and maybe use them as a bank and keep their money uh, they deliver on time and you don't just don't pay them uh, on time and maybe, maybe you have a good reason for that. It happens. I mean, we have, we all have been in cash flow issue periods where we don't have the money to pay them. But is it ethical not to reply to them? And this is something I really cannot uh, stand. Uh, maybe they ask for the money. They have a right to do so, and you don't just don't reply. Is that ethical? I, I saw that many times. Um, I've been in the situation where I've been offered a bribe. Well, I've been asked for a bribe, actually, from a purchasing manager. Uh, they wanted to give me a lot of words to translate and in an ongoing way, but they wanted to be paid, I mean, personally, individually. Is that ethical? What, what, we, what would we all do in that occasion, in that situation? And there is one question that is really close to my heart, and that could be because with creative words, we be uh, subcontracting with young translators a lot. This is what I want to work with. Uh, I love working with young translators, helping them to, to get in the market. But I've been told it's unethical to use less experienced translators and maybe compensate a, a little lower weight to read a lot of feedback, a lot of training. And is it ethical to then to work with young translators and sort of try and compensate the time spent uh, with them and giving them feedback, training them? Because academia sometimes is not uh, up to standards with uh, preparation of students. Is it ethical or maybe is it unethical to work with them? And and the next, and probably 
almost last one would be is it ethical to judge translators based on the, the studies on the experience or should we just uh, maybe test them and judge them on the assess them on the results of, of a translation test maybe or of a pilot project or a real project this is something where we thinking about uh, we do want to uh, to have an unbiased test testing uh, process in order not to even care about it, whether they study translation or not. Uh, sh should we just care about this, about how many years they spent on in school rather than on the quality they're delivering? Or maybe, and I'm sure this is really close to the heart of many people here in the audience, is it ethical uh, to test them at all? I mean, should we test them? Should we just give them a pilot project and pay them? Is it ethical to, to ask for a free translation test? To summarize, uh, the, what I try to implement and, and leave every day is basically try to pay fair rates and fair would open Pandora base about what is fair, but this is, uh, we don't have time for that. Um, we try to be transparent with the customers, again, in relation to the process that we mentioned before. We try to, to tell them what we do with their files. Uh, we try to ensure that our subcontractors uh, behave in a fair way, in a fair way, which is not give for granted. This is difficult also to do. I mean, it's not a matter of certification only. Uh, and we do try to be good with our employees, with our internal staff as well. We have 20 employees and we try to do that. Uh, and we try to avoid conflict of interest. Again, not easy, uh, but sometimes you have to face this situation as well. I believe a code of ethics is really something we should all implement. Uh, difficult, I mean, I, I wouldn't want it to be like another certification uh, used as a marketing tool. The risk is there. I mean, there are so many different certifications from B Corp to translation quality, machine translation, and you name it, you name them. Uh, there are so many that uh, I wouldn't just want the code of ethics to be another marketing tool where translators and LSPs say they abide to code of ethics. And just because in this way they, they feel they're more, you know, they can better sell their services. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to see where this brings us to. And yeah, again, that would be my. Uh, contribution, many questions, not many answers. Uh, hopefully, that will trigger some conversation with better groups. Thank you Thank so you much. Again. Thank you so much, Diego. And asking the question is as important as having the answers because that makes us brainstorm. And such important questions that how do we support the students to integrate into the profession, right? Like, how do we deal with experience versus inexperience? The usage of CAP tools versus not? Like, all of that are such important questions, and in many cases, the standards and code of ethics will be part of the answer, will be something that will really help us to, to get to a better and fairer workplace. Thank you, Diego. Thank our you very next much. Speaker, thank you. Our next speaker is Janice Palma. She is the president of Ikigai, Integrated Knowledge Institute for the Graded Advancement of Interpreters. Janice Palma has had a career of more than 40 years as a federally certified English to Spanish interpreter and Najit certified English to Spanish interpreter and translator. She holds an MA in literature and history from the Centro de Estudios Avanzado de Puerto y el Caribe and is currently working on a master's in legal studies from Arizona State University. Mrs. Palma is a life member of the National Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators and former chair of its board of directors. She is also a member of the Society for the Study of Translation and Interpreting Research Collaborative. Her research interest is in the intersection of judiciary interpreting and meaningful language access for LEP criminal defendants in the US. She also created a nonprofit institute in 2022, Ikigai, dedicated to interpret education and advocacy. You can learn more about that and the website is posted on the chat. Welcome, Janice. 
Thank you very much. It's, I'm really so happy to be here with everybody and so many interesting points of view, questions. So I'm going to throw more at you. I'm going to be sharing my screen. Um, here we go. Um, and I need to start here. Oh, come on. Okay. All right. So um, again, um, this is something that I've been thinking about for a very long time. And I was very happy when Lola invited me to participate. Um, I think that we all can agree that a uh, code of ethics is basically something that tells us what's right and what's wrong. Um, and it has to be relevant to the practice to which it applies, whether it's law or medicine or engineering or interpreting or whatever. So, um, what I see in judiciary interpreting, which is my field, is that we have this mix of performance do's and don'ts with conduct do's, do's and don'ts. And some places call it a code of ethics, some places call it a code of professional conduct, and others call it a code of professional responsibility, and others mix them all up. But um, I don't think that they are clearly defined for interpreters. So. Um, um, I uh, clicked on the wrong thing here. Um, at what happened with the codes of ethics that we have right now is um, essentially there was a model code that was created by the National Center for State Courts. And then that code was adopted by the state courts and generally has been adopted by almost every professional association except for a few. And this uh, initial National Center for State Courts code was uh, written in 1995. So it's about 28 years old. And I would like to see it uh, revised and updated um, because there's a lot of research. There's a lot of things that have happened in our profession that weren't there 28 years ago. And I think they need to be incorporated. For example, um, the code says that confidentiality is interpreters shall protect the confidentiality of all privilege and other confidential information. So we have confidentiality defined by confidential. That's not very helpful. Uh, we know that interpreters are always asking questions of, well, should I do this? Should I do that when this happens? Actually, there is a difference between privileged communication and confidential communication. And privilege is something that um, by cult, by law, is some protected communication between the attorney and the client and only the client can waive it. It attaches to the interpreter through the attorney so the interpreter cannot waive it unless certain things happen. But confidential communication is not privileged and the code does not explain this, it doesn't make it clear and it doesn't address the secrecy of grand jury either. So we need to fine tune that. Um, we also have like, uh, scope of practice, professional demeanor, and representation of qualifications in three separate canons that could probably be re-evaluated um, because they all have to do essentially with our, our practice. It, they, they could all be professional scope of practice. And one of the things that I would like to see, um, and, and I know Diego didn't really like this very much, but I think only credential interpreters should be practicing in a legal setting. And then we could add there that if uh, you falsely represent your training, your credentials, your education, you could be removed from a list of approved interpreters in, in a court because in judiciary interpreting, different states have their own code, which is another problem. Um, and then there's the issue of the meaningful language access for limited English proficient individuals, which derives from a lot of the um, constitutional and statutory law. Um, for for um, those that have studied law, you understand what I'm talking about. I, I think that we could also include the fact that interpreters are officers of the court. And um, we are experts, or we're, we should be experts, so that we could include an expert opinion about a communicative event, which is our field, but never legal advice. And, you know, we can, there's things that, that we can 
look at again and see how they can be improved in current code of ethics. And this is my big pet peeve, accuracy and completeness. Interpreters shall render a complete and accurate interpretation or side translation without altering, omitting, or adding anything to what is stated or written and without explanation. And I can see that 28 years ago, this was necessary because most of the interpreters who were going into um, court work, legal work, we're getting basically, you know, three day workshops in which you learn consecutive, simultaneous inside translation techniques, some legal terminology, maybe something about ethics. But, you know, they were being thrown into the courtroom to work. And this restriction, you don't add, you don't alter, you don't kind of fit within the historical moment. But we know a lot more now about what interpreting is about. There's, uh, like I said, a lot of research, a lot of information for um, what the interpreter should and should not be doing. And sometimes omitting is necessary, sometimes adding is necessary, not because you're adding information or omitting information, because those are techniques in the interpreting world. So um, I think that we also need to refresh the definition of accuracy, whether it's in court or out of court, whether it's on the record, off the record, whether it's in consecutive or simultaneous, they all require different techniques. And the current code of ethics does not address that. Um, uh, we need performance parameters that include the um, pre-appearance in, in court uh, events like when somebody is stopped by the police or you know there's an arrest and there's a custodial interrogation and the the scholarship right now is looking at police interpreting scenarios as something separate from the rest of the judiciary process and it's not it's part of the criminal process and it should fall within the same domain and um Finally, we need to be aware of how the 5th, the 6th, and 14th Amendment in the United States have a bearing on the performance of the interpreter in a legal setting. Essentially, um, what limited English speakers in a legal setting have the interpreter for is so that their due process rights can be protected. And that has implications about the way in which we perform that have not been addressed by the code of ethics either. Um, due process, and I'm uh, quoting for a couple of cases, is far more than a term of art. The fundamental requirement of procedural due process is the opportunity to be heard at a meaningful time and in a meaningful manner. And the right to confrontation includes the right to an interpreter for the defendant so that he can meaningfully understand the proceedings and consult with counsel concerning examination and cross-examination. And there's no guidance right now for interpreters in legal proceedings as to what exactly does meaningful access, meaningfully understand means in our performance. Um, so, I'm convinced overall that our current code of professional ethics or responsibility or whatever you want to call it is in need of some deep and extensive revisions. And if this is something that you think you'd like to work on, I would like to hear from you. So this is my contact information. And this is Ikigai, which by the way, Ikigai is, is a term, a Japanese term that um, I found that truly defines what I want to do. Um, it's it's about finding your purpose in life. And, and this has been my purpose in life always is um, contribute to the betterment of the profession. So I look forward to questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Janice. And every presentation brings a big topic on its own, like the accreditation piece. It's so, so important because so many times we see translators and interpreters being put in a bag. And we need to have a specific credentials that match the specific assignment or the specific you know, uh, type of encounter. If it's legal, if it's medical, those are different credentials on their own. Thank you, Janice. Our next speaker is Julia Parger and from Know Your Worth. 
Julia is a business conference and diplomatic interpreter working with English, Russian, and French, who started Know Your Worth to give your insights a roadmap and confidence to get more business at higher fees with better mm -hmm. conditions. After having received her MA in conference interpreter, interpreting from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, a proud member of AIC, Julia has worked as an interpreter for over 30 years with governments, NGOs, businesses, and international organizations to help messages be transmitted clearly at meetings from international summits to scientific discussions, from business meetings to international arbitration, from building nuclear power plants to putting on a show. Julia loves to travel, can be dropping a country <laughs> where she doesn't speak the language and will be able to order a meal like a native in a, men in a matter of hours sometimes surprised with what she receives. Welcome, Julia. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. And in fact, it's, it's a great honor to be a member of this panel. I would have attended this entire event even without being a panel member. It's been so interesting. Um, I seem to be one of the only ones here representing myself and um, freelancers in general, I guess, those who um, also, you know, have come through my hands and know your worth as well, because I did turn to my know your worth community to get a few tips on things that I might tell you today. So um, what I'll talk about is very practical sides of codes of ethics. And in my view, a code of ethics, especially among freelancers, is what separates the professionals from the amateurs. It shows that you actually take this profession seriously. So for example, um, for me, of course, since I'm a member of IEEC, I abide by the IEEC Code of Ethics, and I use that, you know, quite a bit in, in my work, but um, I even pointed to it when I wasn't a member of IEEC for a couple of reasons. First of all, I truly believe in what IEEC stands for, and it was a very practical way of showing it. And I was pretty much the only one among my colleagues who had ever heard that there was a code of ethics um, for interpreters. Having a code of ethics and recommended working conditions from a larger association is also something that you can point to as an individual freelancer. So if your client is trying to ask you to do something that you feel is unethical or that you feel is just completely wrong, you can point to these codes of ethics that belong to these larger associations and say, look, it's not just me. It's a large group of people who say that this is wrong. And really, codes of ethics, as we just heard from Janice, it's a good way of familiarizing yourself with a new to you area of work. So when I first started working as a court interpreter, when I lived back in Washington, DC, Really, we didn't have a lot of criteria there. And with Russian, there wasn't even a test um, other than the one that I got you know, used to get into the State Department. And so what I did was I looked at the codes of ethics for legal interpreting, for court interpreting, and for the various associations so that I could find out how to behave professionally. So in my case, what I have is a personal code of ethics. And I think that that personal code of ethics helps you to stand out among your colleagues. And let me give you an example. Um, if I commit to doing a one day job for a client who knows, likes, and trusts me, um, and then another of my clients who also knows, likes, and trusts me comes and offers me five days, I will stick with that one day job because I made that commitment. And to the second client, I will say, look, let's work around it if you wish to, or I can recommend somebody to you. But the way that I'm sticking with what I obligated myself to with this first client is exactly what I would do for you if you came along first and somebody offered me a longer job. So it's one way of making sure that your clients can know, like, and trust you. So I turned to my Know Your Worth community and asked them if they had personal codes of ethics, things that they followed that were not written down by associations that they might belong to. And they broke down into two categories. The first category is the behavior on the job or in the booth. So obviously there are certain things that kind of sound like, you know, 
Yeah, duh. But at the same time, there are things that not everybody does. So being on time, or in fact, early, because on time is already a bit too late, isn't it? Um, sticking around to help your partner out and not zoning out or going on social media or whatever. Sticking around to listen and incorporate the vocabulary that your partner is using so that you provi provide a united interpretation for your clients. Preparing well so that you know exactly what's going on. And then the obvious not stealing clients. And yes, this did happen to me. Not just pissing off for an hour or two to go shopping, showing up after an hour or two and saying, okay, now it's your turn to go shopping and I'll hold down the fort for the next couple of hours. Yeah. So anyway, so that's on the job. And then the second side, which I found very interesting because it, it also applies to me, is whom you'd work for. Many of my, of my colleagues emphasize the fact that they have types of clients that they just would not work for, clients that do not share their values, um, clients that, in fact, go against their values. So if they are, for example, a, you know, somebody who is much more of a left-wing political person, they would never interpret for a far right-wing party and their organization, for example. On the other hand, their code of ethics also says that if that far right-wing party person shows up at a meeting that they have agreed to do, they will interpret that far right-wing person fully and completely to make sure that everybody gets the full fat version of whatever it is this horrible person in their minds is actually presenting so that the, the audience can make informed decisions. Another area where a universal code of ethics would come in handy, and I'd love it if somebody would start working on it, is in remote interpreting, because practitioners are scattered around the world, and not all of them are members of the same association or even of any association at all. So we're seeing things like people working overlapping jobs, or working alone for ages, or working for fees that are below a living wage in their own country, just because they don't want to work somewhere else and they want to work from their own living room. Um, but we're also happy to have work that sometimes our brains kind of turn off and we suddenly take something that we would never do if it was in person. And even if we were to extend a code of ethics, like, for example, AIC's code of ethics to remote work, your partner may not actually be following it. So you end up in a situation where the person who is behaving ethically is actually bearing the burden of most of the work because the interpreter who is not behaving ethically and who took overlapping or even simultaneous jobs can't show up for their full half hours on, on mic for either of the jobs. So therefore, those of us who are behaving ethically are actually bearing the brunt of the work for them. So remote interpreting seems to be a fertile ground um, for, for a new good code of ethics. There are a couple of things on the negative side I just wanted to bring up about having and working to a code of ethics. And the first is something that Christiane already mentioned. You can't really police them, as Christiane said. And so even more so, if this is your own personal code of ethics, along with a code of ethics that, that belongs to an association, you can only see the consequences in how your colleagues and your clients treat you afterwards. And the second thing is that having a code of ethics could hit your bottom line. You're not earning as much as the interpreter who is working two jobs simultaneously. You won't work alone, so maybe you won't get that particular job. But on the other hand, your clients will know you, like you, and trust you. They'll rehire you, and they'll refer you. And then I think you might be able to raise your rates so you don't actually end up having to work two jobs at the same time. That's it for me. Thank you very much again for having me. Thank, thank you so much, Julia. That's an, another level of going above and beyond, like adding that personal code of ethics to the existing code of ethics out there. And I look forward to seeing the universal code of ethics. I'm sure that at one point it will come. It, it is very necessary. Thank you, Julia. Uh, our next speaker is Laura McGilvra. She is a member of the Board of Directors of the National Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators, Najit. She is an active conference interpreter and culture consultant and a Washington State Court Certified Mandarin Chinese interpreter. Laura has a master's degree in conference interpretation from University of Maryland and has taught interpretation at Middlebury Institute of International Studies. 
Laura holds a degree in journalism and nursing as well. Growing up in Taiwan, Laura worked on small farms and in factories to pay for her tuition. She enjoyed working to support herself and her humble family, and she believes this experience helped to build her character of hard work and perseverance. Her diverse working background helped gain a deep understanding of challenges that interpreters face in various fields. She is a strong advocate for setting an appropriate working environment, such as working together with your colleagues rather than against each other in legal settings. While continuing to improve her knowledge and professional skills, Laura also remains active outside of work. She enjoys hiking, traveling, gardening, playing the piano, baking, and fencing. She also loves to relax with a good podcast or book, and she loves animals, especially dogs. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Um, my name is Laura McIlra, and I represent Najat in today's panel discussion in the topic called, of Code of Ethics. Um, I am very happy to have this opportunity uh, to be here. So let me share my screen. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Okay. It looks like we're seeing your notes, actually. You might have to share the other version. Oh, shoot. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It's not working, is it? <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just going to go without my PowerPoint slide then. So um, um, the previous speakers have covered in the, a lot of grounds in the general topics of the uh, code of ethics. So I'm going to drill in a little bit from the angle of uh, ethical challenges in the workplace. And as we all know that um, everybody is no strangers to these uh, working environment, there are many, many work uh, ethical challenges in our workplace. And I think that being aware of those challenges while working is a challenge by itself already. And I think that um, it is very important that we are aware of that so we can avoid the pitfalls, especially uh, when you're working in the uh, the judiciary uh, or court proceedings or legal proceedings. Let me um, go in from uh, talk about this topic from a very recent uh, court case that I covered because recently uh, my colleague and I worked in a criminal case that was a trial. And in this trial, the prosecutors and the uh, defense attorney, they were arguing back and forth before the jurors are selected. They wanted to um, find out if they could introduce a piece of evidence, which is an audio recording of a 911 call. And they were uh, addressing the issue of whether or not the interpretation in the, during the 911 call is uh, accurate because they use a non-certified interpreter. And then back and forth after that, the judge ultimately uh, ordered the court certified interpreters to interpret that bit of evidence and to decide whether or not that piece of evidence can be introduced to the jurors. Immediately when the judge said that the we, my colleague and I, we realized that that might be a violation of our code of ethics because um, according to our standards or practice of code of ethics, we are strongly discouraged to interpret audio recording in the open courtrooms. Um, so we raised the issue to the judge and the judge said that we, he understands. And uh, um, so we played the video, uh, the audio. This is before the jurors were selected. And the first round of the audio sounded like the, the women in the audio uh, was screaming that you were hacking us with the knife. She was actually implying that um, she was stating the actual situation as is what's happening. And then when they played the audio again, it sounded like she was saying to uh, the guy and say that, why don't you go to grab a knife and hack us with it? So in this version, it sounded like she, the guy didn't really have a knife in his hand. She was provoking him to go grab a knife to come to hack them with it. So during the breaks, my colleague and I, we had a discussion and we discussed some potential violation of code of ethics. And there are some uh, challenges we could come up with. And one of them is about accuracy because as Janet alluded to earlier, like, you know, one of the definition about the accuracy is the interpreters must try to produce in the target language, the closest to natural equivalent of the source language. Um, in this, in the short hearing to this piece of evidence, we were able to come out at least two different versions of rendition right there already. And then we started to question if this, if we were asked, to introduce or to interpret this during the open courtroom when the jurors are there, 
what kind of potential legal implication that could produce. So after the break, we actually asked to talk to the, the judge in his chamber to express our concern, also told him uh, about our code of ethics as well as our standards of practice to uh, tell, tell the judge that we really uh, have strong concerns about this and we should not be asked to interpret this during, in an open courtroom. And uh, the judge finally agreed that he will not uh, ask the interpreters to interpret this during the, in the open courtroom when the jurors here are there. And actually he said that he only going to allow the attorneys to ask the, um, the potential, the, the alleged victims to actually uh, explain what she actually said in the 911 call. So in the end, in the testimony, the uh, alleged victim actually uh, explained that she was actually saying the different version of our rendition. She was saying now, uh, why don't you go grab a knife and hack us with it? Um, so as you can understand that if we were to interpret this during the open courtroom, it came out with the first version of interpret you know, in the ver first version that could lead to a conviction of the uh, defendant. And so I would like to uh, use this as a way to uh, tell everybody there are many ways that we can safeguard ourselves as well as to that the entire, uh, at least that the judge as well, the greater community of the, judici the judiciary committee have community to know that how, what our standards of practice should be, that one of the way we can do is to keep a copy of the standards of practice and ethics with you whenever you go to a courtroom or go to a legal proceedings. Because whenever something comes up, you don't think it's quite right, you can refer to it and you can present that as a way to back yourself up. And in our case, in this particular case, we actually send a copy of the standards of practice and ethics to the judge. And to the attorney, before we actually started uh, the court proceeding, the judge actually read it. So he actually has a basic understanding of how our code of ethics, what they are, and also know what our ethics are. So it was much easier to communicate that aspect with the judge, and he was able to understand this much, much better. And then uh, the third thing I would recommend people to do is to leverage your coworkers, because this is a teamwork situation. We all know how taxing it is when we are working in a uh, uh, interpreting situation that you are busy interpreting. It's very difficult to realize that some pitfalls might be coming out or some potential uh, violation of code of ethics might be coming out when you are working. However, when your colleague is there, that colleague could be on the lookout to think of maybe this could be a problem. Then we can raise that issue to the judge or to, or to the attorneys. And lastly, I would say that um, we need to proactively inform the court uh, of our professional standards because nobody knows this better than ourselves. We should not rely on them to know what our code of ethics are. A lot of time, I think our colleagues are too passive about this. We think the court or the judge should know what we should do or should not do, which is not the case. In our case, we actually, before the uh, actual trial began, when the judge and the attorneys were discussing this, we actually had our voice. We told them, you know, this is not how it should be done. This is how interpreters work together. And they understand it. So um, it's very important that we stand up for ourselves and to advocate for our own rights and for our own standards. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Laura. Another big topic, client education. There are many times that the clients may put the interpreter or the translator in a situation of violation of the code of ethics, not because they want to, but simply because they don't know. And us as a, a profession educating the client, we are really making a service to, to, the, to those clients and to the profession overall. Mm -hmm. So we have one more speaker, last but certainly not least. We have Giovanna Carriero Contreras. She is a founding member and chair of the American Association of Interpreters and Translators in Education, AITE, and tirelessly focuses on promoting the professionalization of interpreters and translators and language access. For over 30 years, Joanna has been a noteworthy leader in the language industry space. She is a thought after industry national and international speaker. Joanna is not only a seasoned translator and interpreter herself, but is also an interpreter trainer and published language industry author having co-authored the Community Interpreter, International and the Medical Interpreter. 
She has been a master trainer of trainers, DOT, since 2016. As a strong proponent of professional development for interpreters and the advancement of the profession, Giovanna is, a very, act, is very active in the interpreting community and is involved in developing professional standards for the interpreting industry on the national level through ASTM International and on the international level through the International Organization for Standardization. Giovanna is a member of Advocacy and Language Access Committees at ALC and of the Standards Committee at ATA. Giovanna was honored with the 2020 Bill Daniels Ethical Leader of the Year Award for her unwavering commitment to principle-based ethics in business to promote language access for limited English proficient individuals. Welcome, Giovanna. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, thank you to all my friends and colleagues that have presented before me. And Diego, if you thought that being the sixth was difficult, being the last one is, <laughs> is double difficult. So, but there is there is pros and cons of being last. First of all, good thing I didn't have a PowerPoint because it would have been completely different by now. And so I am going to kind of add to what you all have already shared. And uh, I, I think that I want to start with what Christian's uh, closed with, which was professional identity, which is uh, one of the main concepts that is very dear to my heart. And uh, that was first published in the community interpreter in, in, um, back almost 10 years ago at this point, where I started working on the difference between a personal identity versus a professional identity. When we now talk about code of ethics, to me, code of ethics is not just a list of uh, rules that we must abide, but is a list of concepts that we must live by. And it's a living practice. I personally don't believe that there is a huge difference between um, ethical principles in your professional life and your values and your morals in your personal life. So you cannot be honest when you go interpret and then uh, uh, rip someone off when you are sending an invoice. So for me, certain things go hand in hand. And so I want to propose an holistic approach to how we as professionals leave the code of ethics. And I enjoyed how Christian put it at the very beginning, talking about code of ethics being principles and then the standards of practice is how we adapt and understand this principle in the practical implementation of each one of our fields of specialization. Educational interpreting and translation is a a very um, complex specialization because it's a little, it's the crossroads of many different specializations. So we touch on legal interpreting and translation. We touch on uh, medical with the, especially mental health with the IPs, et cetera. It has a very complex way to present terminology full of acronyms, full of differences between state to state. So when we talk about understanding a national code of ethics and how that applies to the work that we do in our single districts, in our everyday life, it becomes really paramount. What I mean by that is just providing a list of ethical principles does not mean that we know how to apply them. For me, the most important, and I say me as a person, and that's what I project in the work that I do, the most important principle, principle is integrity. And I have to this word a sort of holistic approach. If you think of what the word means, um, integrity is uh, defined as um, something um, that is is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. It's defined also as moral uprightness. But the second meaning to of that word is the state of being whole and undivided. And that's why I say aligning who you are with what you do with how you deliver your services. Talking about other 
principles such as accuracy, and I would like to complete a little bit on what I have heard from Janice. The reason why the code of ethics for me should be at the basis of a framework is because there are two main concepts that we should consider. One is the ability to use tools that allows us to make the right decision at the right time. Interpreting and often translation in our field really deals with everybody, people's real lives. It's not a speech that you prepare. It's really what happens to, to people day by day and the challenges that they have as parents and as students. So when we approach the code of ethics from a black and white, and I know that the, the, the phrase may not be very uh, a very happy one, standpoint, we kind of tend to put things in boxes. We need critical thinking to be applied to this together with other decision-making tools. Things can change just because one variable of that situation changes. And just saying, I need to be accurate, I need to keep confidentiality, I need to keep my role boundaries does not make that decision effective because what we need to assess at every step of the way is what we are doing. What is the story that we're dealing with? One of the ethical challenges that is very common for us as an interpreter is that very fine line between being an interpreter or being a bilingual liaison, for example. We, there are also called community navigators. We are very involved in the people lives, in the life of the people that we advocate for. Because as a liaison and as a community navigator, you are advocating for those families, right? So how do you really now become all of a sudden impartial? You, you cannot say unless you, more than what you have heard that you have to stick with it, etc. You tell me if a nurse in a school is asked to also to do a secretary job. There are not many professions that go across two worlds that in themselves have present very ethical challenges, right? And um, I really enjoyed what Claudine said about all the challenges from a translator's perspective. And uh, I find very interesting that someone else on a public panel, thank you, thank you, Claudine, um, had the courage to say, is it really ethical to ask, you know, whether we are qualified for the job when we know that many of us get to interpreting and translation without any training? One of the things that I also try to, um, one of the other, the concept that I try to really instill when I talk about ethics is uh, the ability to people to be empowered by the ethical framework rather than entitled. The, the ethical framework that should be there for our professions, and yes, we are a profession of influence, should be there to protect the work that we do and the people that we interpret with. However, as we deal with real lives, we are also, we also feel compelled to do whatever we can to make things up and right. Well, right in the way we would like that to happen is not necessarily right, the right that we have to do to be compliant with laws, for example, right? Now, I may also say that we all are aware of uh, the saying that says, the one that is without sin cast the first stone, which means that none of us is ethically proof, um, bulletproof. We all make mistakes. And this is why I also think that sometimes a code of ethics and standards of practice are very diminishing because in order for us to be able to make the right decision at every step of the way, is also the ability to talk about scenarios before we get there. In other words, the brain is a wonderful machine that can be trained to make the closest possible to the right decision only if we have the ability to talk about it, 
to think about it because there is no much that we can get in a code of ethics beyond the ethical principle, the standards of practice, and one of two examples. But again, how do we read those examples? Everybody will read them through their lenses. And so I, I did like what Regina, I think, was talking about the, the ethical exams. And for me, the purpose is not really necessarily the exam, but is the exercise that comes before the, the test in order to try to have these conversations. Because I go back to what I said to the very beginning, the code of ethics, ethical principles, morals, and values are a way of living. It's not just something that you put on a computer and remember, oh, I need to be accurate today. Yesterday, I didn't do a really good job. To go back to the um, um, unethical question of uh, are we qualified to do the job and uh, my suggestion of let's learn to be more empowered rather than entitled, it really goes back to the fact that None of us would trust a lawyer or an attorney that don't present their credentials. And even though I'm totally in agreement with uh, Diego, that there are some very gifted and talented people out there that can do this with very little investment in a very beautiful way. But the reality is that we are there for the profession. And for me, one other concept that is a value in my mindset rather than an ethical principle is legacy. By doing, by behaving in a consistent way within a profession, we create legacy for the one that comes after us. I, as a professional, stand on the shoulders of giant that have educated me and opened doors for me and uh, allowed me to connect with those that I could learn from, but I also think that is part of my legacy to open the door for others and to open uh, the door to others. I would like to spend a few minutes and I do not know how many minutes I have, um, uh, Lola, so just you tell me. Go, you can go an extra minute, you're the last one, that's good. Cool. So the, uh, the wonderful ethics and committee standard, uh, ethics and standards committee at the AATA the American Association of Interpreters and Translators in Education has actually worked for the last year and a half plus to create a code of ethics for interpreters separate um, from translators working in education because none of what was out there was really fitting our field of specialization. We have lived for years um, of, of what had been created for medical interpreters. And some of the attempts for code of ethics that have been made for educational interpreters and translators take a lot from that code of ethics, but we are different. And now I started confusing who said what, but it is important that we look at what we do and we update what we have done because most of the code of ethics that we have out there with very few exceptions were created at the beginning of the association decades ago and as our professional professionalizes concepts have the different relevance um new ways of presenting words that 20 years ago had one meaning today are read with different eyes so we do need to adapt even our framework, because the way itself that we have to work is different. What was interesting in the work that our committee is doing is that because of the, sometimes the overlaps of these tasks for educational professional, language professionals, it was kind of difficult to say, oh no, hold on, but this is the code of ethics for translators. Accuracy for an interpreter has to be read differently from accuracy for a translator. And so it was a very interesting way to go through. The committee started with assessing and studying the code of ethics, even of other professions, just to understand how this conversation about ethical principles has to be considered and how from there the standards of practice actually applies in the practical life. So that was an interesting journey. 
And uh, we are going to have a very, a very nice conversation at our first edu conference that is going to happen in three weeks in Denver on uh, May 5th and, and 6th. And you can check on our website, aaite.org, for the conference coming up if you work in the educational field to know more. The last thing that I want to bring up is that all the questions that Diego brought up, as you said, Lola, are all applicable in the educational settings. Why? Because staff and independent contractors have unfortunately or fortunately different hats. And depending on the hat that you are filling, you are going to have, if you have a solid ethical print principal framework of reference, you are going to be confronted with each one of them. So that maybe is to be followed up on. But I could go on and on and on, but I thank, wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Giovanna, and thank you to all our panelists. This has been incredible. Uh, we have discussed about the need to redesign or rewrite so many of the code of ethics and the different professional associations. As you're saying, the world is different. And we are speaking about a way of living. How do we adapt to something that was written 10, 15, 20 years ago with today's reality? And I love, Julia, what you mentioned about a universal code of ethics for remote. That would be such an incredible gift to the profession. Profession by default, the word profession cannot exist without a code of ethics. And it's something for each of us to think and look at those decisions. So we are going to go into a period of Q&A. We have you know, discussed so many topics that we could stay here for the whole night, but we are going to have probably 15 minutes right, of Q&A. Uh, we talk about trust, honesty, copyrights, protecting the public, machine translation, relationship between the professionals and the client, using the code of ethics, such as a point of negotiation. Uh, you know, We cannot police people and so on. So as you can see, there are is a multiple, multiple uh, point of view and points about the code of ethics. So raise your virtual hand, please, if you have a question, and we are going to uh, let you unmute and uh, bring you to the floor. So who has a question? And if you can please mention, to, to your question is addressed to which speaker? Okay, let's see if there is anything on the chat. You have these nine speakers here. After the Q&A, we are going to go into breakouts where you can have the one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. So if you have a question, you can post on the chat or raise your hand. I saw a hand. Oh, Janice, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. I just wanted to thank Giovanna for that perfect, empowering rather than entitling interpreters and translators by code of ethics that was beautiful beautiful thank you thank you janice okay do we have other questions or comments if you have oh Chris, yeah christine come on come on in wonderful i think you can probably hear me yes, yes okay great no fantastic so um my name is christine i am I used to be an interpreter a few years ago, but I'm now in a program administrator role. Um, and the comment is with, or common question is with regards to the qualifications or the certifications that we expect interpreters to have before they go into, into, the, into the job. So part of my task is to identify people in the community who have really strong language skills and then train them to become community interpreters. So they may not have had any, any studies beyond grade 12, that's the minimum that we require. And a lot of the, um, the individuals that we end up training and hiring as interpreters are coming from refugee situations, running away from wars, uh, like they would be members of the vulnerable communities as well. So Giovanna, I see you nodding. Um, when, when the interpreters are serving their own communities and marginalized populations, I guess it's a question for anyone who would like to answer. We are training them and certifying them to become interpreters. What else would be the, well, we do testing and core community interpreter and medical terminology. So we, we complete those training for them. Why would we want to expect a bachelor's degree or any other like, degrees rather than studies. Thank you to anyone who would like to answer. 
Thank you, Christine. Okay. Who from the speakers would like to answer that? I can I can start with that, and then someone else can uh, chime in. Um, the um, the need for a bachelor or high school has been really at the core of a lot of conversations at the ISO standards level. Um, we, I, I think that that's where the critical thinking comes in, right? Um, the, 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 fact, the, the fact that you have or you can show that you hold a BA is useful to show your ability to cognitively process certain concepts. That is the, the, the important factor to keep in consideration. And of course, for the sake of time here, I am kind of simplifying the conversation, right? The fact is that we do not have today a set um, set of testings that allows, uh, allows us to really understand whether or not only a training can make that interpreter ready for the work that they're called to do. In other words, if I am a Spanish interpreter or I am a Burmese interpreter and I am interpreting for, the deposi for a deposition, I am confronted with the same speech from the DA, from the judge, etc. And uh, concepts are like speedy trial don't even exist in some, uh, in some cultures. What is the ability that they are able to interpret that? But also what is the cognitive processes that are involved to even understanding a counter um, questioning of the witness at the stand? So the conversation, I, I totally, the, there is a practical need that we have to train interpreters because the demand is much higher than the supply. But we should have open conversations about it because it's not true that we can certify them all. Yeah. And I see that Claudine has her hand up. Thank you, Claudine, and then Janice. Claudine, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you for the question. It's very good. And of course, I agree with everything uh, Giovanna said. So well said. Um, I will just add that um, we do what we can because of necessity, but we must have path forward. In other words, um, before the first um, college, you know, doctor's college, there were doctors, right? Before the first professors of medicine, there had to be some practice. Otherwise, that was not possible. However, I would not be ecstatic to find out that someone uh, wants to uh, treat me and did not go to college, right? So, you know, every profession starts somewhere and it cannot be that the college comes before the practice. So this is where we're at right now. Uh, actually, this is where we used to be, but now there are colleges, there are programs, there are there is training and what you're doing is actually already superior i'm talking to christine is superior to what is done sometimes is that there's no training at all uh, but uh, a training uh, i don't know how long your training is i'm assuming it's not as long as a bachelor's or a master's and it is still supposing if we were to stay mm -hmm. here it's supposing that language is not at 40 45 hours okay it's still good but we're still supposing that language is not as complex as it actually is and that subject matter is not as complex as it is. How long do lawyers go to school? How long do judges go to school? And you might say, yeah, but you're not creating the content still for proper interpretation. You still has, have to understand uh, the subject matter. So that's a whole other uh, set of uh, information mechanics. I was a technical translator. But, uh, you know, I realized how many hours I had to spend to try to understand the concepts. It would have been probably easier for me to get a, an engineering degree, right? So, so, we, so, so this is, um, we want to be practical, but we as a profession, we're representatives. As long as we're practitioners, we're representatives. But even if we were just clients or even the public, we can make moves. There are certain things that we can do to start insisting on the fact that higher education is necessary because... Uh, because two-year-olds can speak, we have this tendency to think, 
that uh, language is simple, just like piano playing is easier maybe than trumpet or violin at first, but piano playing can be extremely complex and so can language. So let's just keep those things in mind is that, yeah, it's great to have training. 45 hours is already better than so many, you know, uh, uh, do, but we really do need to push and a bachelor's is not even enough. And a master's, no, we have to keep pushing and complexifying and making more sophisticated the learning so that the bar is raised all across the board. And, and before we go with Janet, thank you so much, Claudine. Something to remember is to acknowledge the wins and all the progress that has been done in the sector over the last 30 years, because there is a lot that has to be done. Every profession, as Claudine was mentioned, had to move from an occupation to a profession. And there are very set stages to go there, right? Like training is one of the early ones training, standards, work experience, accreditation, to finally get to legislation. We all want legislation, but we are not going to get there unless we get that standardized training, that standardized you know, code of ethics and standards and so on. In Ontario, for example, we do have a training that is 180 hours for community interpreters. When we were creating that training back in 2006, people at the table were saying, that's too long, no one is going to do it. And you know, so many years later, and we have so many graduates from LITP. So definitely we have a path and it's something that because we have people here from around the world, we can see the differences, but the actual path is the same no matter where you are. So there are certain requirements before you get to that accreditation stage. Uh, Janice, next. I want to add to what's already been said. <clears throat> it's, um, it's about language. We, this is our instrument. And if you don't understand how language works, you're going to be just doing something very mechanical, but you are probably going to miss out on nuances of language and communication, which is what the additional education brings to your performance. And somebody mentioned not enough remuneration. Well, you don't get enough remuneration because you're not bringing in that professionalization of somebody with an advanced degree, for example. Um, and it's it's all related. If you have more education, the profession has more prestige and therefore better pay. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. And the next one is Mihai. Mihai, go ahead. Oh, you are still muted, Mihai. You need to unmute. I apologize. Thank you, Lola, Janice, and everybody else. This is a fantastic uh, session on the topic of ethics. What I'm interested about, is, it's something slightly, I don't know, different. I look at this from an angle of, as I'm going through the process of getting reciprocity from state to state, each state in this country, I'm talking about the US, is it, it's, it, it, it's almost like a different country because ethics in Iowa is not what ethics in uh, Utah or in, um, I don't know, Nevada means. Some of the states actually developed ethics exam that you have to drive in person, you know, four, 500, 600 miles and take them there. So th this is a requirement that if you want to be on their roster, you need to go and drive and take a, a 25 questions test, which takes about half an hour. And so I'm I'm putting about 2,000 miles uh, in the next 30 days, trying to get reciprocity from an ethics perspective and have that credential, you know, under my belt. But my question is simple: um, Is Najit, and I'm saying Najit because I, I cannot think of another institution thinking to make like a universal test that once that you take it in state A, you're not going to reinvent the wheel and take it a million times in other states at the at the price sometimes of driving or you know. Uh, being, you know, on trips that I honestly and humbly I consider them a little bit unnecessary? Or how is that perceived? Because in reality, it is the same ethics test, whether somebody develops something in 30 questions or in 50 questions or in 20 questions, essentially we're talking about the same things, ethics and responsibility. So I'm interested, has anybody said, wait a minute, we have too many ethics tests state by state, Let's try and find something that is going to work for everybody. Thank you. So you say not just so I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm going to talk <laughs> So um, 
I I don't believe that uh, at this point, um, Najat has any uh, plans for doing something like that, but that is a very good uh, suggestion. Um, I will definitely take that back to talk to the board about it. But I would say that essentially, though, um, I understand what you're saying that we are taking redundant, uh, it's redundancy, we're taking the same ethics test there. And then um, we wanted to make sure that people can abide by those, uh, the code of ethics. And then um, if where you take it, doesn't matter, you know, you take it as long as you get it done, you know, the same set of questions, you know, same set of tests, why do we have to do it, you know, at different places, right? Um, I think that is a very valid point. And um, if you're asking if Nadja has any uh, plan to maybe uh, initiate something like this, um, at this point, I don't know if we have anything like that or not, but I will definitely bring that back to the board and we can discuss this. But I would say, though, code of ethics is something that we should hold near and dear to our heart. And uh, having that test, it's very important, but ultimately, we should hold it to ourselves responsible for that. And uh, taking the test, it is very important. Um, we should always hold each other responsible for, you know, abiding by those code of ethics at heart. Because I have seen colleagues taking the test, but they don't abide by those code of ethics, which is, not, it doesn't matter how many tests you take. And um, if you don't do that, it's really deteriorating the, our profession. And it's really, you know, we're trying so hard to build a reputation of this profession, you know, whether or not we want to have a higher education, we want to take the code of ethic test. Ultimately, the goal is to make sure that we all take this very seriously. Eventually, even if we don't take the code of ethics, we know what we're supposed to do. Um, I understand what you're saying. I'm going to definitely take that back to the board and then talk to them about it. And thank you for that wonderful recommendation. Thank you so much, Laura. Najid has always been at the forefront of all the professionalization initiatives. And we'll take one last question. We definitely want to go into breakout so you can have that interaction with the speakers. And we do have a speaker from Europe, which is very late in there. And we want to wrap up by, you know, a little bit after six. So Kawal, you were the next one. Come on, if you can ask or make the comment concise, please. Um, my question is about, it's not directed to any particular speaker, just a general question. And it's about the new immigrants who come to Canada. They want to learn about the profession and they go and volunteer with organizations. And then they discover that they have the skills, excellent language skills to be a good or professional interpreter. So before I bring professionalism uh, in it, I'm just talking about being an interpreter. So then they go through, they try to gain experience, they go through various agencies, and then all the agencies have their own code of ethics. And I have seen some agencies have a code of ethics which says your loyalty is towards the person who pays you. So this confuses the interpreter and they don't know what to follow. I am a trainer as well. I train interpreters and this question comes to me that who should they follow? Which code of ethics should they follow? Because every if the ministry has own accreditation system, there is own certification system, and there are several, several code of ethics, set of code of ethics. So I would like guidance here for myself. How do I guide these people, whether they develop? And I know one of the speakers also uh, spoke about personal standards, having personal code of ethics. So I really would like some guidance. How do I develop? a set of code of ethics, which can help others, newcomers, not the professional ones or trained ones. Thank you, Kawa. Thank you. And Julia, you, do you want to address this one? Since you talk about the personal code? Certainly. Um, okay, yes, I am unmuted. So <laughs> developing a personal code of ethics is something that basically you need to think about for yourself what your values are and you obviously have very strong values right now for helping the new immigrants helping the new interpreters and and so on um so basically that is your value and 
that is the way that you should be acting. So for example, taking a look at all of the regular codes of ethics, the ones that exist, like the IE code of ethics and so on. Collegiality is something that's mentioned in there. That's something that's a strong part of my own personal code of ethics, even without IE. And so therefore I will always do whatever I can to help my colleague on a job. So in your case, what you need to do is develop your ideas as to what you feel is right in whatever the situation and give yourself some case studies and think about them and talk about them with people um, that are interested in what you have to do and develop them that way. I'm afraid that it's it's not easy. It's something that I've taken years. I mean, I've been interpreting for almost as long as I've been alive, quite frankly. And, and you know, my code of ethics is constantly developing and and changing according to the way the world works and the new things that I hear. I'm sorry, I can't be any more detailed in my help. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. So we are going to proceed to go into break